Hello, and you're listening to Your Majesty's Secret Podcast. I like my podcast, Shaken, Not Stirred, only on the Four Eyed Radio Network. If you'd like to check out more shows, go to foureyedradio.com. Shaken, not stirred. Utter one more syllable and I'll have you killed. I thought Christmas only comes once a year. For your eyes only, darling. I never joke about my web 007. For England, James? Come in, Univex. James Bond here. Am I going to have a problem with you, Bond? Allow me to introduce myself. You're that secret agent! That English secret agent from England! No, you're cleverer than you look. Hmm, still better than looking cleverer than you are. My God, what's Bond doing? I think he's attempting re-entry, sir. 007 reporting for duty. Hello! The name's Berkeley, Ziggy Berkeley, from Cinema on the Rocks. And with me is Eric Dewey from Socially Awkward Studios. And you are listening to Her Majesty's Secret Podcast, only on the Four-Eyed Radio Network. That's right, it's the show where we talk about bondage! James Bondage! And today we're going to take a hop over to Craigslist! Oh, yeah. Not in that dirty way, you sick-minded people out there. What, you mean the uh, misconnections or the (laughs) men seeking women or women seeking men or men seeking men or men seeking foreign objects? No, no, no. We are actually going to be discussing some of the films of Daniel Craig. Yes, we've talked about Mr. Connery a couple times, talked about Mr. Brosnan. So now we thought we'd look at some of the non-James Bond work of Mr. Daniel Craig. Indeed. And we're going to start off with the movie which, according to just about every story out there, is the one that landed him the role of James Bond to begin with. Apparently, Barbara Broccoli watched this movie, thought this would that he would do a fine job taking over for Fierce Brosnan, and offered him the role based on this performance. So what we are referring to, of course, is dessert, which we're going to eat first. <laughs> <laughs> now we're talking about Layer Cake from 2004. Indeed. Yes. Uh, so this is a movie I had not seen this movie prior to. In fact, actually, um, with the exception of the, our uh, possible surprise conversation at the end of this show, um, I had not seen any of these movies prior to preparing for this episode. I admit so, that surprises me, but we'll get to that later. OK, well, there there was one of the films that we're talking about. I had originally wanted to see and then I had uh, kind of skipped over it due to it just getting uh, less than stellar reviews from many people whom I actually trust their opinion on movies. And so it just it never made it as far as actually being watched. I had uh, uh, picked it up at one point and thought about watching it, but hadn't actually watched it. But Layer Cake is not that movie. This movie is one that actually uh, flew in under my radar. I had not uh, heard about it when it came out, really. Um, it, you know, obviously, Daniel Craig was not yet on my radar, so I wasn't paying any attention to, to anything he was doing. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's an uh, interesting film. Indeed. Um, Layer Cake is a British gangster movie uh, made in 2004. And what we have is it's the story of a drug dealer whose name we never really are told. He's listed in the credits as Quadruple X. Oh, yeah. That's one more X than Triple X. Yes, which means that Daniel Craig is not a woman. Come on. It's a stretch, but you got it. Tell me you got it. (laughs) Yes. No, Daniel Craig plays a drug dealer without a name, but we know his name. We'll get to that, I think, in the course of the discussion. Um, And what we're following is about, oh, what do we say, about three days in his life, two, three, something about that, something like that. Yes, it all happens within a fairly short period of time. Um, We see a little bit of the, the, you know, the setup as he's kind of walking us through at the beginning of the film. We see, you know, a glimpse as to what got him to where he is now. But yeah, essentially, we're just seeing a few days. Um, He's a successful drug dealer and uh, he is looking to get out of the business he's looking to retire he's he's all prepared of course he's, he is because they all are <laughs> um yeah so this is a basically a story of his boss sending him on uh, one last mission um that's well out of the ordinary for him before he retires of course though his boss isn't supposed to know of course yeah i'm sorry oh i, I was going to say although his boss doesn't officially know that he's going to retire yet or, or at least uh Quadruple X does not believe that uh, his boss knows, but that's uh, 
comes up a little bit later in the film. Yes, Quadruple X thinks a lot of things aren't going on that are going on. But the method of storytelling for Layer Cake is it's even though it's filmed in the in the third person, as most sensible films are, um, it's told very much from Quadruple X's perspective. And one of the reasons that it gets away with never having to tell us his name is he's telling the story. A lot of what's going on, he's telling us in voiceover. So along with seeing him in action in these scenes, he's also giving us a voiceover narrative of what's happening, yeah. including the fact that his idea of being a drug dealer is make your money and get out. And it starts off actually with a really interesting treatise on the whole nature of illegalized narcotics, which is to say that he as the drug dealer, and I think we can trust the screenwriter and who is also the novelist for Layer Cake is based on a novel of the same name by J.J. Connolly, mm. who adapted his own novel to a screenplay. You can tell that they're of the opinion that drugs being illegal is just damn silly. <laughs> and one of these days, the government is going to wake up, according to the narration, and just tax the hell out of it. And then all the drug dealers will be out of business and the government will not have any debt anymore. Um, Which so, is very plausible, especially when you look at uh, you know states like Colorado and Washington who have done exactly that. And it's had exactly that effect. They have not seen any rise in any other type of crime that people are always screaming about. Oh, well, if people are smoking pot. They're also going to be robbing stores. I mean, what? No, it doesn't, doesn't seem to work that way. Matter of fact, it seems that uh, everybody's pretty chill about it. And guess what? The state's got so much damn money now that they tried to give it back to the people of the state. And the people of the state said, no, you know what? Put it towards the schools. <laughs> We're good. Um, so, yeah, it's. I think eventually we will get to that point um, where that will be the way things go. But it's interesting the way they, they tell it. You know, that shows him kind of just walking through his normal operation, dealing with all these illegal drugs. And then it it uh, shows him essentially walking through a drugstore and kind of showing that, look at all these drugs that are already legal. And there's nothing saying that these are any more dangerous or less dangerous than the ones that are le illegal. It's just different marketing, basically. Yeah, and it, it's a really cool visual, too, because what you see... It almost looks like the scene from The Matrix when Neo is standing in the white room and he, he says he needs guns and all these guns show up <laughs> on racks. And it starts off looking kind of like that, where you have Daniel Craig walking through this white room and on these shelves are all these things that are labeled for illegal drugs. But then it morphs into a real drugstore with regular displays on the shelves like we expect to see in whatever our drugstore of our locality happens to be. Walgreens, CVS, London Drugs, um, you know, far more wherever you happen to live. Um, it's It just looks like a normal drugstore, but it morphs from this futuristic thing into reality. And it's, it's just a really neat visual that goes along with that. I, I really liked how that was done. I like I like the cinematography and the editing in this movie. Yeah, I agree. Um, I did like the um, the way that it was put together and the way the story was told. It felt a lot like it, it did remind me of other British gangster films that I've enjoyed. You know, you're, you're locked stock in two smoking barrels and your snatches, things like that. Good. Without to have this discussion. Yay. <laughs> Sorry. With, without the over the topness of those films those films are obviously you know uh, super exaggerated in their in the way they tell their stories this one is not as much so um it's still you know tells the story in a very fun way and you still get that you know distinctly british sense of humor and wit about it without it uh, being nearly as violent and over the top violent as those other films with that said, it is violent. We do have a head and a nice chest. Oh yeah. So I mean, let's I'm not, not saying it's not violent. I don't don't get me wrong. I'm not saying there's zero violence. It's just um, if you compare it to those films that I mentioned, those ones are more consistently graphically violent throughout the entire film. This one, I think, is a little bit little bit tamer in some of those oh, respects. Yeah, it, this is not a Guy Ritchie film. Uh, absolutely not. Nor even though I got the vibe of it several times, because like. Like you said, this is a very distinctly British gangster flick, and anyone who's only seen American gangster flicks, which unfortunately I know is going to be a lot of our audience, um, you really can't appreciate that until you've seen 
a couple British gangster flicks and realize that the atmospherics are very, very different. Yeah. So I would strongly encourage you to dig deep into the lore of the British gangster flick. Um, I'll spoil this right now. Go see Layer Cake because I know I loved it. Um, I would also suggest um, the ones Eric just brought up: Snatch, Lock, Stock, Two Swung Barrels. Now again, they're very different. That they're not. Those two are much less serious. They're much more over the top with incomprehensible accents and stuff like that. But and then this is a movie I brought up before. If you really want to see what to me is the quintessential British gangster flick, watch the original Get Carter with Michael Caine from 1971. That is one brutal ass flick, but really good. Smiley, I do need to still check that one out. I remember you recommending that one previously, and I haven't gotten a chance to uh, to go check that one out yet. But a yeah, very distinctly Brit gangster flick. And if you're wondering why a gangster flick would be called Layer Cake, it's a metaphor that's explained toward the end of the movie, uh, basically describing the hierarchy of the drug business where, you know, you start as just some kind of lackey and then you end up being the sharp businessman where quadruple X is now. But then there are the layers on top of him who actually call the shots. Even when he thinks he's calling the shots, he's not calling the shots. So you have the layer cake. And that's what that description is of. It's the description of how gangster society works. Yeah. And it's very effective. It, it, it has that meaning, of course, in this film. But it also, you know, it, it comes to mean the way that this story is being told as well. Because you start at the bottom and you, you get these different layers of the story as you go um, to, to see how it eventually ends. Which yeah, I don't want to spoil the ending. I, you see, that I, that's something I wanted to bring up as well. Because of something very specific about it, I think we have to. I think when we get to that point, we should give a warning to our audience members that for 60 seconds, if they really don't want to know, they should go <laughs> la la la. La la la, I can't hear you. Because I, I think this needs to be spoiled. Cause oh, all right. I, and I know you know why, because you've seen it. <laughs> so. Yes, yes. Uh, I can understand that. Yeah, I just, the ending was a little, uh, well, when we, when we talk about it, we'll talk about that. But yeah. Uh, yeah. And another nice thing about Layer Cake, along with it just being something that stands very tall in the pantheon, I think, of British gangster flicks, is holy shit, the cast. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it is a cast of people who weren't really as well known at the time that it was filmed. Because honestly, at the time Layer Cake came out, if you weren't in Britain or really paying attention to British film, you had no idea who Daniel Craig was. Now, outside in the United States and elsewhere, you would have known who Call Meany was. Oh yeah, he's Miles O'Brien. Yeah, from Star Trek. I was I was happy when he popped up on the screen because I didn't look at I didn't look at any of the information. I didn't look at the cast. The only person I knew the name of who was going to be in this film was uh, Daniel Craig when I went into it originally. So when he popped up on the screen, I'm like, yes, Chief O'Brien's here. <laughs> yes, and one of the people at the top of the layer cake is played by Michael Gambon whom many will recognize from Harry Potter films, but he's a character actor who has been everywhere and just phenomenal actor. I, it's wonderful to see him in this film. But also in this movie, we have some unknowns like Sienna Miller and Ben Wishaw and some dude named Tom Hardy. You know about right, this guy? Who are these people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I will admit, after seeing him in this movie... Even though I've seen a lot of other things with him in with him starring in them, I've softened up my opinion on okay, he could be Bond. Who Tom Hardy? Yes. Hmm. Hmm. Cause I really like him. I mean, He's a good actor. I do enjoy his work. Um, I could get past the fact that, and this, and I know this is not a negative for many people out there, especially the ladies. His lips look like an orange turned inside out, but that's okay. <laughs> He's he is a good actor, and. I've I've liked him in everything I've seen him in except for Star Trek Nemesis, which is not his fault. <laughs> uh, yeah, Nemesis was was a little rough. Um, yeah, wow. <laughs> we don't like to talk about Nemesis. And then of course we have Sienna Miller playing his playing Quadruple X's new girlfriend, whom he has stolen from Ben Wishaw, who we all know as Q. Oh yeah. What did you think of Ben Wishaw in this movie? Um, he was he was good. I liked him. It was not uh, he was not Q. That's for sure. <laughs> but 
It was it was interesting for sure. Ben Wishaw plays this. He plays a relative of this jerk gangster, so he's got privileges. Mr. Wishaw's character of Sydney, but Sydney's kind of an idiot. <laughs> And to just see Ben Wishaw, after having gotten used to him as Q, <laughs> playing this club hopping, clueless jackass, <laughs> it's just hilarious. It is so quite entertaining. It you get a double dose here as a Bond fan because you get to see Daniel Craig playing the playing this drug dealer character with the I can totally see. Well, we'll get to this in just literally a couple seconds. You get to see the proto-Bond, and then you get to see Q in college, basically. (laughs) The kind of Q who did bongs, both (laughs) kinds. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Very different, uh, different version of the character, for sure. But, so, I can say for sure that I definitely saw what Barbara Broccoli is said to have seen in Daniel Craig when I watched him in this movie. What did you see? Um, yeah, I could I could see uh, the beginnings of the Bond like character. You know, he definitely had that uh, that swagger about him, like he knew what he was doing. And even though he kept being put into situations where he didn't know what he was doing, but he still basically acted as though he did. And that's a very Bond like trait, I think. So, yeah, I could definitely see how this would have if if this were the only thing that someone were judging on i could definitely see how it would be uh you'd be right to to judge him as bond and not only that but he's a player in this movie he's very much a bond like womanizer i mean we don't even get five minutes into the movie when we see a scene of him having sex with a woman from behind and there's nothing left to the imagination except perhaps his plumbing that's about it uh, and then he goes ahead and he picks up Sidney's girlfriend out from under him who would then become famous in films like well, G.I. Joe, and I believe she was also in Star Trek. I might be wrong. Or was it just Rachel Nichols, or were they both in Star Trek? I don't remember now. But anyway, um, so he's got he's got that aspect down, and as you said, he's got the swagger, and he has to operate in a clandestine world because, honestly, a drug smuggler and a spy, their worlds aren't necessarily that different. No, they're both kind of operating in the shadows. Um, you know, they they both have to avoid detection. They have to make their own contacts and stick with their, you know, kind of protect their own. So, yeah, it definitely, uh, there are some parallels there for sure. And then it's also interesting how at the start of this movie where Quadruple X in his narration is first telling us about the drug business in general and how and why he got in and that he's going to get out and that on the day we meet him, it's basically going to be his last day and he's retiring and he's not telling anybody. He's just going to get his laundered money and get the hell out. And so he gets invited to lunch with his supplier and he thinks, oh, what the hell, I'll go to lunch. We all know, being audience members, <laughs> or are savvy to this kind of thing, that this is going to be a mistake. On the other hand, since we also know some other things that have been happening that he didn't know about, it's probably better he went to lunch anyway. But one, thing, one other thing we find out is that in the course of becoming a successful drug dealer, he's never killed anyone. And so he doesn't even like guns. And so we get to see him... First, be very trepidatious about getting a gun and then suddenly think, oh, I like this one. This one's sexy. (laughs) So he picks up a gun, a very Bond looking gun, very much looks like a classic Bond poster gun, actually. And then we get to see him make his first kill, much like we would do a couple of years later in Casino (laughs) Royale. I just thought that was cool. Yeah, it was it was definitely a uh, a great spin. Um, I, I liked that the fact that he was basically kind of like, oh no no, I don't do guns, I don't do guns, and then oh hey, well, this gun's pretty cool. Uh, so that was interesting. Yeah, and we also get to see him questioning his profession. I mean, he does that from the very start, but this I think has been the hallmark of the Daniel Craig James Bond character because no other Bond character. Had, no other actor in their interpretation of the Bond character has really done this in the way that Daniel Craig has. We've seen it in books, but we have only really seen it in the movie from Daniel Craig, where from the very beginning, he doesn't want to do this for his, the rest of his life, even though he seems born to it. Yeah. And that's something that his character in Layer Cake tells us from the start, is that 
I'm in this for now and then I'm out. And in fact, this is what Daniel Craig himself has said, even before people started harassing the crap out of him, that he's playing James Bond for the money and eventually he'll be happy to get out. Now, with that said, all the rumors that have been going around lately, please take them for the pile of shit <laughs> that they are. I mean, none until it comes from either Eon Productions or the mouth of Daniel Craig, it's bullshit. So, I mean, honestly, if one of my friends started spouting off to the media about, oh, I'm pretty sure he's done, I'd tell him, look, either shut up or you're not my friend anymore. <laughs> and while I could totally buy the rumors about Rachel Weisz being plausible, that she doesn't want him to play Bond because he keeps getting hurt, and that he'll only play with her blessing, I mean, okay, married couple, fine, I can see that. Hmm. But either way, that's not even coming from her, that's coming from out of class. So my position on rumors, and I know this is one thing that sets this show apart from a lot of other fan shows for a lot of other fandoms, I'm not into rumor mongering. So until I hear it from Daniel Craig or until I hear it from Eon Productions, it's crap. Yeah. So as far as I'm concerned, he's under contract for one more film. He's back for one more film. That's how I'm looking at it. Yeah, yeah, I I agree. It's there's rumors flying back and forth, and that's the problem is that there's there's rumors saying that he is, and there's rumors saying that he isn't. So it's like, well, obviously they both can't be, they can't both be true. So it doesn't really matter. You know, one of them has to be false, and until we hear an official word one way or the other, there's no point in bickering about it. So I hope he's back for at least one more. I, I really think that we need a proper sequel to Spectre with him and Christoph Waltz. Um, I think that's the best way to continue that story. However, I do have confidence that uh, if that's not the case, that they'll figure out how to tell us a good story either way. They have consistently, over the course of more than 20 films, given us good stories almost every time. I'm <laughs> confident that they will continue. <laughs> I, I'm confident that they'll continue to do so. I don't believe that we're going to suddenly get another Die Another Day. I don't think we'll get another Die Another Day ever. I think Barbara Broadway sure will gouge someone's <laughs> eyes out with a spoon if that ever happened. I would hope so, because holy jeez. But, um, yeah, you know, and even even that, we found ways to make it entertaining. So, but, uh, yeah, I, I trust that they're going to do the right thing for the story, regardless of who ends up playing the part. Um, personally, I would prefer to see uh, Craig at it again. That would be my preference. But they don't consult me about these things. So Now you're referring to as Bond, not in the sense of that scene that happened toward the beginning of the movie where him and the... Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, a a as Bond. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah. No. So uh, overall, uh, Layer Cake, definitely a good film. Uh, I quite enjoyed it. I do highly recommend anybody who has not seen it yet to give it a watch. Um, and for those of you who have not seen it, um, I'm thinking now would probably be a good time to uh, to shut off for just a minute. Or do All you right, have anything going, else to talk what about before we get there? Is I'm gonna be lo I'm looking at the clock now, and we do truncate our silences on on this show. So if anything, I'm gonna be giving it more time than is actually necessary. But when I say now for 60 seconds, anyone who does not want the ending of Layer Cake spoiled should fast forward their recording by 60 seconds, and then we will not be spoiling the end of the movie for you after that 60 seconds. So when I say now, 60 seconds of actual recording time will be loaded with spoilers. <laughs> All right. So now. So what's really, really cool about this ending is that Q kills James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> this is the part that I especially did not like about this movie. I was so like, I wanted it. He finally, he went through all that crap to get away. He dealt with trying, basically his boss sets him up to be killed. I mean, this is the plot of the movie. His boss figures out that he's trying to get out of it. He basically tells him and he, he does it in such a way that if looking back, you're like, okay, he knew because he said it. He, he said, you know, there's a reason why men like you don't get out of this business because you make too much money for men like me. And it was kind of like that moment. It's like, oh, wait, okay. So, so he knows already. But and that's the thing. The original ending of the movie was not this. This was filled as an afterthought. The original ending was that him and Sienna Miller drive off into the sunset. Credits roll. 
But the director said, you know what? That seems too Hollywood. So instead, we will have this special ending, except our 60 seconds are almost up. (laughs) I was mad about it. That's all I'm going to say. I agree. I would have liked the ending that was originally proposed as opposed to the ending we got. The ending we got is really funny if you're a Bond fan. Now, we're in spoiler-less territory, so I'm not giving details anymore. But... If if you're a Bond fan, the ending as it stands is really funny. I also don't like it. But there was another ending, which we discussed in the spoiler minute, where I would have liked it much better. And it's actually similar to the lines of there are certain superhero movie tropes and comic book tropes that I don't like that speak to the same thing. And But before we get to the ending... Just this movie is so well done it, that the intricacies are very much like a James Bond plot. And Daniel Craig paints all the numbers beautifully. I mean, whether he's in control, not in control, faking being in control, <laughs> faking not being in control when he's in control, just all of it. He is so Bond in this movie. And he is surrounded by Bond-like characters. The only thing you really don't get in terms of a Bond character in this movie, is a really standout Bond girl. I mean, we've had Bond girls like this before, but realistically, and I hate to dig down for this term, but this one's just, she's just, a, she's just there. I mean, she's just bedroom fodder. That's what she is. That's all she is. She's not really a character so much as someone for our hero to sleep with and get in trouble for. And so we don't really have a Bond girl per se in the awesome Bond girl sense, but I think we do have a cast of villains and henchmen who are worthy of some kind of Bondy necessity in some form of Bond film. And I think we have allies who fit that same category. And hell, we have Q. (laughs) So I can completely see why this movie was the one that put Daniel Craig solidly in the running as James Bond. And I'm really glad that Barbara Broccoli got to see this movie because I, as we've talked about before, I love Daniel Craig's portrayal of James Bond. So there we have it. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, I definitely highly recommend the film. Uh, definitely uh, give it a watch. It's it's worthwhile. So uh, check it out. Yes, indeed. That was Layer Cake from 2004. And as is our custom, we're going to be moving on in chronological order to a different movie, a very, very, very different movie. And this is from 2006. So we're now going contemporary to Casino Royale. And that is a movie called Renaissance. Now, this movie, this movie threw me for a loop. First of all, I had not even heard of it at all. Um, (laughs) Pulled it up on uh, this one's actually available on Netflix. And I pulled it up on Netflix, and the very first thing I noticed, I typically don't look at ratings for movies, regardless of whether it's something that I'm watching for the show or whether it's something that I'm just watching on my own. If I'm interested in the premise, I'll watch it regardless of what uh, random online strangers have said about it. The only uh, you know exception to that is when there are people whose opinions I trust specifically about movies because they tend to like the same things I do, who if they tell me it sucks, I might stay away for a while. Um, I had not heard anything about this movie from anybody. I pull it up on Netflix, and the first thing I notice, of course, it's got the star ratings right there from other people who have watched it on Netflix, and it had like one and a third star. <laughs> I was like, oh, this does not bode well. But maybe, just maybe, I will uh, enjoy this film more than all of these people who took the time out of their day to give it such a lowly rating on Netflix. Because, of course, his co-host who comes up with the show notes would never, ever, ever (laughs) steer Eric wrong. He has never done this because he wouldn't do that to his best friend, would he? (laughs) Okay, Zardoz. Anyways. um, (laughs) So, um, yeah, so I went into it thinking, all right, well, let's see if I see something that these other folks didn't. First thing I didn't know about this film was that it was animated. I fire it up on Netflix. I start watching it. Credits. At first I thought, oh, cool. It's got an animated credit scene. No, no, the, the movie is actually animated. I did not did not know that going in, so that was interesting. Um, the second thing I noticed about this movie is that it was bad. <laughs> it was really, really bad. I did not enjoy this film at all. I don't know if you uh, enjoyed it more than I, but my first impression as I got about halfway in was, ugh, 
Now, I will be asking for more detail about that. <laughs> for my part, I own this movie. And now, you never granted, did answer the question that I asked when I found out that you own this movie. My question was, on purpose? Now, the story behind why I own this movie <laughs> is that I found it in the Blu-ray bargain bin for five bucks. Okay. I had never heard of this movie, but I see animated sci-fi. Daniel okay. Craig, five bucks. Hell with it. I'll get that. All right. So I picked it up. That is why I own the movie. Okay. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. All right. That's, that's fair enough, I guess. I mean, enough people had to think this was a good idea that it got made. Um, but enough people agree with me that it's got very poor ratings. The Blu-ray is on sale for five bucks in a bin. <laughs> so I know there are people out there who do agree with me as well. Well, now, to be fair... I did not choose this movie knowing you would hate it. Honestly, I did not do that. I was pretty sure you'd hate Zardoz, but I think Zardoz. <laughs> this movie I thought could go either way. With that said, I suspected it was more likely you wouldn't like this than that you would, <laughs> but I thought there was hope. All right. So now I'm guessing that when you brought this up on Netflix, it did not include or you did not choose to avail yourself of the behind the scenes uh typically netflix doesn't offer those things if they do it's completely separate it's not like uh it's not like a dvd menu where you can pull up you know pull up the movie and then pull up all the special features and whatnot with netflix it's typically just the film every now and then they'll have uh back you know behind the scenes featurettes for various films also available um but i did not see anything that came up with this one okay for anyone who's curious and who goes to the $5 or the £3 or whatever it happens to be <laughs> bargain bin where you live, two euro, I don't know. If you pick up the Blu-ray for this, there is a behind the scenes bonus section. This is not a five minute or ten minute behind the scenes featurette. No, this is a very long behind the scenes featurette. And it's really interesting. I really recommend that as a supplementary piece after you've watched the movie because... I, d I don't believe in watching movies first after seeing the behind the scenes, and I don't believe in watching movies first with the commentary track. I believe movies should be experienced pure first, and then you get the commentary track, yeah. says the host of a podcast where we spoil the hell out of movies. <laughs> um, but, you know. But we assume one... in, the, in most cases that either the people listening have already seen the films, especially when we're talking about the Bond films specifically, um, or that they have no intention of seeing the films or they would turn it off because we do make it very clear when we're going to spoil things and uh, we don't intend to actually spoil anything for anybody. We want you to enjoy the film for what it is uh, first, if at all possible. Yes. Now, with that said, Renaissance, one thing that you'll learn and maybe suspect when you watch the movie, but what you will learn for certain if you watch the behind the scenes, the concept for the visual style for the movie came first. Story didn't come till afterwards. In fact, the story came last. <laughs> it, now see that, I can believe. <laughs> Like, okay, we've got this idea. We're going to do this really cool kind of noir-esque kind of, you know, this. I don't know. Um, when did um, Sin City come out, the first one? Sin City, I believe, came out before this. Um, let's see. Yeah, Sin City, the original, came out the year before Renaissance. However, Renaissance had been in development for a long time. Okay. Um, now, that said, Sin City is based on a graphic novel series. Just, I'm going to assume independence. Um and the style is not quite the same as Sin City because Sin City is animation over photographic acting. Yes. Whereas Renaissance is straight up black and white animation. It's based on motion capture, but it's not it's not to the level of animation over photo that you see in Sin City and it is not to the level of rotoscoping. Either it's somewhere in between animation and rotoscope. So, and it is stark black and white. Mm -hmm. It is very much a noir visual. And actually, I think they accomplish that fairly well. It takes place in Paris, circa the year 2054. I do kind of wonder about the dating. I always tend to find that future casting in sci-fi is either too long or too short. Very rarely does it seem just right. Um, one example where I think they got it right 
in terms of how the city looked. If you ignore the time travel aspect, is Looper. <laughs> um, just as <laughs> Which I actually example. really enjoy. I don't, uh, I don't know if we can ever yes, figure out a way to I'm, talk about that on this show, but um, good film. I recommend it. I do too, and we'll actually be bringing up something about that later. Um, really, we will. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm down. <laughs> But with Renaissance, the style came first, the stark black and white and Paris of 2054. The other thing to note, and I think this is important, and I think in the end, this might have contributed to your dissatisfaction with it in an off sort of way. Renaissance is French. So the actors who we have doing these voices are not the actors that the animation is based on. Um, The motion cap actors are all French. The original language of the film that it was conceived of in is French, though you can tell this was definitely made to be put out to the English-speaking market. But one of the pitfalls of that is when you look at these characters and you hear the voices, even if you don't know what the actors look like, you have a 50-50 chance of that voice does not match that body (laughs) or that face. Especially with Daniel Craig, who is much more lean and angular than he is in real life. And he's playing a character of French North African descent. Now, visually, that doesn't really matter because everybody is white. (laughs) So because this is straight up black and white. But so I don't mean white in the Caucasian sense. I mean, white in the white, all colors into one sense. Um, (laughs) But his voice does not match his body. Was that one of the things that bothered you? I'm curious. Uh, honestly, no. That that didn't really come into it, other than the fact that I, you know, occasionally I would like, oh, okay, that's Daniel. That's definitely I'm definitely hearing Daniel Craig's voice, but I'm not seeing Daniel Craig, and that's a little disconcerting. But I can usually I'm usually okay with that when it comes to animation, because even when in in animated films where they try to make the characters look somewhat like the actors supplying the voices. It's still never quite right. And so I kind of give it a pass on that. That part I don't mind. What I did mind was that I did not particularly enjoy the animation style. It Its novelty wore off very, very quickly for me. Um, like I said, it would, I think it would have made a great style for the opening credits and then transition into live action. Um, I didn't I didn't enjoy it throughout the entirety of the film. It, it almost felt cheap is what it came off as to me. Like, it's like, okay, they really wanted to put this story out but didn't have enough money to do it properly, so they made this quick black and white animation and tried to call it stylized. It just came off as, as a cop-out a little bit. Um, the voice acting... That, that, was, that, that, that loud sound you're hearing is my jaw on the floor. <laughs> Uh, go on, please. <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, but yeah, for me, it just it it didn't hit the mark. Um, it never captured my attention. The plot line, while somewhat interesting, it do- did have a somewhat interesting plot. However, it was extremely stretched to fill a feature film. I feel that this story could have easily been told in 20 or 30 minutes, and instead they dragged out what did we, what did we end up saying? It went an hour 45. So um, that's a lot of stretching to my mind to force this story into a feature film uh, where it could have easily been an episode of a TV show, or you know, I I can't imagine telling this story in more than an hour. To be honest, it was really really drug out. Wow! 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 I sense you disagree. <laughs> One, I don't think the animation style looks cheap at all. In fact, I would be willing to bet it was the most expensive thing about the project. (laughs) I don't doubt that it actually did cost money to to put together, and I'm not trying to disparage the artists who actually worked on it, because I know they probably, you know, they had this idea in their mind, and I'm sure that they put their heart and soul into making it uh, to to do what they wanted it to do. Um, But just, you know, as an observer from the outside, I'm looking at it and thinking, "Hmm." I don't know, it, it felt... It, it felt cheap. That's what it came down to for me. Um, and I, I hesitate. I don't want to say it like that because I know that that you know sounds very disparaging to the people who put their work into this film. And I don't think that they actually copped out on. I don't think it's a you know just a matter of oh we just got some uh, some some guys in a little Korean sweatshop to uh, throw <laughs> together some animation for us. Um, no, I truly believe they put the work into it. It just 
you know, sometimes you look at something that was really quick and cheaply put together, and it looks like it took a long time and a lot of hard work to put together. And other times you can look at something that has, took a lot of hard work and time and effort to put together, and it still comes off feeling kind of cheap. So it's just a it's a pitfall of any art, really. You can have it both ways. You can have things that look like they took a long time that were very quick, or vice versa. See, I I like the visual stylist. It, to me, it it covers up for a lot of things. I I really enjoy it. I I, I think it's cool. I. I really appreciate the stark black and white. I like the visualization of the futuristic Paris where you still have some of the very old world back to the era of the Sun King buildings. And yet you also have a Paris that becomes very, very modern and it turns out to be gigantic. It's like almost... It's somewhere between Paris and Coruscant in terms of, for Star Wars turns out there, like <laughs> ourselves, um, where it's starting to grow into such an ultra-modern city that it has layers that never end. I mean, some of the rivers end up being carried over, carried over bridges rather than bridges over the river. The river is now on a bridge because the city has just sprawled and taken over. And even though I think in real life this would be disconcerting as hell to walk over a glass sidewalk over a subway station, it's still very cool to see an animation. And in fact, I think it's better to see an animation because it would freak me out seeing it in real <laughs> life. Um, I dig this style. It's it's very, very cool to me. Um, that's just my taste in art. So now... I admit I was kind of weirded out sometimes by the lack of synchronicity between what I know some of the voices to be and what they look like. Because Daniel Craig's character of Karis physically looks like Boris Karloff, to be completely <laughs> honest. However, in terms of how he behaves, Daniel Craig is a fantastic match because Daniel Craig vocally, to me, sounds like someone who is very much aware of the sophisticated world, worldly in terms of his outlook, in terms of his mental acumen and his powers of observation, but he still comes across as a working man in his voice. And I think that shows through in his approach to Bond, who's a very, very worldly man, but he's also very down to business. And I think that fits this character. In fact, this, again, is a character who feels like he's born to his life as a cop, and yet he says, if there's a way out, tell me. And this is, again, something we see in Craig's Bond. And this is something I didn't catch the first time I saw the movie. I didn't catch it till about the second time. The time I watched for this was the third. Um, it seems to be something that Craig picks up in a lot of his characters. So I thought that was cool. And then you had you visit a few other char uh, actors we've seen before because one of our ultimate bad people, whether he is the true ultimate villain or not, is actually a matter of interpretation. Is our villain from Tomorrow Never Dies, Jonathan Price? That was a voice I picked up right away. Um, he started talking, I was like, "Wait a minute!" <laughs> and the thing is, even though that character looks nothing like Jonathan Price, the voice fits. Yeah, the voice works for that character, even though it's. Definitely as far from Jonathan Price as you can possibly get. This is a, a large, bald gentleman as opposed to Jonathan Price's rather small <laughs> frame. And then also we have the female lead, Bislane, is voiced by Carolyn McCormack, who played Pierce Brosnan's lover in The Tailor of Panama. I have fun memories of that. <laughs> but I love the style. And when it comes to the story... I felt exactly the opposite of you because I thought that the story itself was told in about the amount of time that was appropriate. You might have been able to shave off a few minutes, but I don't think 45. I, I think maybe you could have turned this into an hour 40 if you wanted to, but hour 45 was fair, I thought. And I thought the world presented was rich enough that we could take side trips and it's a world I could see visiting again. So I definitely did not. That's why I'm shocked when you said that 
this movie was over long. It it just felt like to me the story could have been condensed further. Um, as far as the world is concerned, yes, I agree. The the world was very interesting, and I wouldn't mind seeing. You know, it, it might be interesting to see like a series set in this world, and I could easily see this plot <clears throat> being an episode in such a series. Um, you know, but for me, it just I didn't think there was enough enough depth to the story to warrant the length. I think they, they it felt to me as if they were digging for for depth that wasn't really there in the story um there were some scenes that i felt drug on a little bit longer than they absolutely needed to um even though they were interesting visually it still it just it kind of had that effect for me of just kind of dragging a little bit I'm like okay i get it it's black and white it's animated all right i get it now just tell me the story and i didn't feel that feel that they got to the the telling of the story quick enough and uh the story itself while interesting it, it felt like a drug because of that what was one of the scenes you thought could have been cut out? I'm, I'm curious. Not necessarily cut out specifically, but definitely shortened. Uh, the scene when they when they break into the research facility and there there's a lot of time spent there, especially in the dark after they shut the lights off and the uh, the, the henchmen are hunting them down in the dark with their night vision goggles. And there's a good portion of that scene that is completely black because you're essentially seeing it from their point of view and they can't see in the dark. But... It, it felt overly long. It felt like that was drug out, especially for the payoff, which wasn't it, – it, it didn't add enough to the story to justify its length, I felt. And things like that are kind of what, what turned me off a little bit. So you'd rather there were cars involved? <laughs> cars are always fun. Okay. I, I'm, that's, that's a matter of taste. I'm not judging you, really. <laughs> Promise. Um, I don't agree with you, but I'm not questioning your judgment. <laughs> well, that's why we have two O's. We exactly. Talk about it all the time. But yeah, this is exactly why, um, you know, me personally, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this film to anyone unless they, you know, happen to say that, oh, I'm really into artsy animated films. I'm like, OK, well, this might be something that that might interest you. Um, but yeah, just the casual viewer. It's not one that I would personally recommend. Obviously, it sounds it, like you would. So it's done in a style that looks like a graphic novel, but it's not based on one. Mm. This is an original story. Um, and honestly, I tell you, visit this movie before visiting Snowpiercer, which is based on a French graphic novel and which, while it's visually pretty in stages, uh, just sucks. You only watch that movie because you like Tilda Swinton, which is why I watched that movie. <laughs> and this is where you also learn that Chris Evans should play nobody but Captain America ever because he sucks as anything else. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I did uh, I did see that one because it was on Netflix and everybody's like, oh, yeah, it's such a great movie. It's so revolutionary. It's so this, it's so that. And I watched it and I was like, oh, it so sucks. <laughs> what the hell were you people talking about? There was nothing revolutionary about it. It was just kind of meh. And if you would like further discussion about either Snowpiercer or Renaissance, I happen to have reviews up for both on my site, cinemaontherocks.com. Do it. So go, go ahead, go there, click on the movies link. I have a listing of all the movies I've reviewed in alphabetical order, including all but one of the James Bond movies. I will review it sometime, I swear. Um, but, you know, Christmas only comes once in a great while. <laughs> But as far as Renaissance is concerned, we have a split decision on this movie. All right. Um, I like it. Eric does not. Yep. Any other comments you have on this film? Um, no, like I said, the, um, the, the basic storyline, the, the world in which we, we see it's, uh, it's interesting, but um, ultimately it just falls a little flat for me personally. And for me, I, I really enjoy this visual style. Um, the story, while it's been done before in one way or another, still plays off very well. And I like the kind of futuristic world that marries the future with the past. Um, visuals are obviously borrowing from the likes of Blade Runner and Metropolis, which is to say they're borrowing from Metropolis because Blade Runner borrowed from Metropolis. Uh, so um, I think it's a very visually interesting film that is also rewarding enough in the story department that if you find it like I did in the $5 bin, spend the five bucks or the two and a half euro or whatever it is, wherever you are. Um, it's worth it. Or if you find it on Netflix, like Eric did, give it a watch. It's so it just depends which of us you tend to believe more. <laughs> well, either way, it's only an hour 45 out of your life. So, you know, yeah, it's not like you're watching interstellar, which is six months out of your life. <laughs> God, I never want to watch that movie again, ever. It had a few moments, but that was about it. Yeah. Great concept. Bad. Movie. But anyway, 
And that brings us to the most commercially well-known of the three initial movies we will be talking about when we visit Craigslist, and that is from 2011, Cowboys and Aliens. Cowboys and Aliens, all right. Based on the graphic novel of the same name, it features Daniel Craig as outlaw Jake Lonergan, who wakes up with total amnesia and a strange piece of iron on his wrist. And, of course, he is in the Old West, specifically 1873 Arizona. And he's about to find that there's more than just cowboys out in that there desert. (laughs) So, before I go on too far, what did you think of this movie, Eric? Uh, I had high hopes for this movie. Um, This is the one (laughs) that um, I had heard of and had actually been interested in seeing uh, until... It got pretty much universally panned by anybody that I trusted about movies. Um, everybody I had spoken to who had seen it, who, whose opinion I trusted, was like, ah, "I was no, just no." Ladies and so and I, I'm starting to think that Eric doesn't trust me. <laughs> you you had not said anything about this film, as far as I recall, or if I had, I had I'd forgotten time about to it. Say it. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> um, I do ask you to watch these things. So. <laughs> so I went into it thinking, okay, hey, you know what this is one that I had wanted to see originally and then had been kind of turned off of, but hey, you know, I get to go back and, and watch it. And, um, you know, it's it, it's an interesting premise. You know, you always see these uh, these movies that feature aliens coming to Earth from one form or another are usually either in the future or in present day, whenever that particular movie happens to come out. It's not often that you see it set this far in the past. Um, so that's an interesting premise. I'll give it that. Um, execution was lacking, I felt. I did not enjoy this film all that much. It had its moments. There were a few bright spots. But overall, I ended up agreeing with the people who had told me to to skip it in the first place. Really? Interesting. How did you enjoy enjoy this film? Well, I went to see it the day it came out. (laughs) However, that's not an indicator of anything. Um, Anyone who knows me well enough personally realizes that I often go to see movies the day they come out, just what I do. Um, So that doesn't tell you anything in and of itself. For example, I went to see the remake of Godzilla the day it came out. Woof. But anyway... (laughs) Um, Now, with that said, when I decided that this would be one of the movies we would be discussing when visiting Craigslist, I had the opportunity to do one of two things. And because I had only seen the movie once in the theater the day it it had come out, of course, I'd only seen the theatrical cut. There is a 15 minutes longer extended edition available. You can get that on Blu-ray from Amazon for five bucks. You can rent it in HD on Amazon for four bucks. I rented it. So that should tell you something. <laughs> I did also watch the extended version. Uh, you had said that that's the version that you were going to be watching, so I made sure that that was the version that I watched as well. So I don't know how it compares to the original version because I've only seen the extended version. Um, however, that is the version that I watched as well. So I don't know what was added. I just really? know what I saw. You, you, you couldn't tell? Because... Uh, I, and I'm asking that honestly because when I, usually when I watch a movie like that, it's pretty easy to tell. Sometimes it's not, but I thought in this movie it was super easy to tell because everything that they added on was a moment where it was strictly character dialogue and the story had stopped to a dead halt. <laughs> so I can see why they cut this stuff out. It was it it added some flavor to the characters but it totally it totally did bring the plot to a grinding halt so one thing that i would say to our listeners is that if you are going to watch cowboys and aliens and haven't already if the movie interests you and you have seen it before but you're still interested in seeing it again watch the extended cut because you've got nothing to lose and it costs you no more money if you have never seen cowboys and aliens before and it interests you, I will ask you a further question. What do you like about a movie that calls itself Cowboys and Aliens? <laughs> Are you looking for an action-adventure flick, or do you want to know about the motivations of the characters and their backstory? If you want a pure action-adventure flick, watch the theatrical cut. 
if you want to know about the characters and their backstories, watch the extended edition because that's what you're getting. You're not getting more action scenes. You're getting more blah, 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 blah. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, like I said, it wasn't bad. I don't want to give the impression. Like, I enjoyed this one more than I enjoyed Renaissance. I'll say that. Um, <laughs> however, I wouldn't. Oh, I do have one more question about Renaissance. Uh huh. Given a choice, you can watch Renaissance or Zardoz. <laughs> What do you pick? Oh, oh okay. Now, I didn't hate Renaissance that much. I mean, <laughs> didn't enjoy it. I didn't say it was punishment to watch. Um, yeah, I'd have to have to take Renaissance over Zardoz there. Um, I guess it would also depend on how long it had been since I'd seen the other. Um, if it was right now, today, I think I'm still a little too close to that viewing of Zardoz to go back to it again. That's me in four or five years. Maybe I'll be ready for another viewing of Zardoz, and I'll, t- I'll bite that bullet. But uh, You realize I'm marking this on my calendar now? <laughs> You're like, revisit Zardoz. <laughs> Oh, my goodness gracious. Uh, no, but Cowboys and Aliens, it did have, um, like you say, it, it does have the action. It does have the, uh, you know, you've got Cowboys, you've got Aliens. You do have, I think, a lot of a lot of the official critical review I heard of the film was that people didn't, didn't seem to respond to that. And they didn't like the futuristic aliens coming to the Wild West. The, you know, for whatever reason, they would prefer that aliens visit present day or the future, I guess. I don't know. Um, I was okay with that. In fact, actually, I found that to be probably the most interesting part of it was just the basic premise. The fact that, okay, hey, uh, what if, what if aliens did come then instead of now or in the future? Um, now granted, there'd probably be some sort of recorded history of it if that had happened, but it's a story. It's okay. So I didn't have a problem with the premise, uh, based on on that um i just didn't really think it was all that interesting a story and as far as the action is concerned yes so the action was fine but i didn't think it had anything special that set it apart from any other action film or any other alien film that we've seen okay um i'm going to circle back i'm going to circle the wagons ah, ah, ah. back to this in a bit because i do want to get to this but i also don't want to hit the audience with another monologue yet because I try to be conscious of that. <laughs> <laughs> what did you think about Daniel Craig specifically? Um, besides his atrocious American accent, <laughs> um, it was weird to watch him speak and not hear James Bond because I wasn't hearing a British accent. And the accent he was speaking in was just weird and off-putting luckily he spends most of the movie not really talking a whole lot so that works out (laughs) in his favor in this case um i'd say the acting uh was fine for what it was again it was it was an action flick first and foremost it was an action flick so there wasn't a whole lot of you know intricate dialogue there wasn't a whole lot of deep emotional stuff that had to be portrayed it was just you know stringing the action scenes together and for the most part that was fine There were a couple of scenes where he had to speak more than one or two sentences at a time, and then it became a little painful to hear. And maybe if I'd never seen him in anything else, and, you know, if this was the first time I was seeing Daniel Craig in something, maybe it wouldn't have bothered me so much. But being that I have known him as James Bond and everything else I've seen him in, he's been speaking with his normal accented voice. It it was it was off-putting. All right interesting um one thing of note is that daniel craig was not originally intended to be in this movie he was a not quite but real close to last minute placement originally um this movie had been intended as a vehicle for director john favreau's friend from iron man robert downey jr who would have played the lead role as an ex-Civil War officer. Hmm. Um, However, when Robert Downey Jr. dropped out, they then rewrote the character um, without the Civil War aspect included and just made him a straight-up outlaw and called him Jake Lonergan, and we got Daniel Craig in the role instead. Now, What happened? Did Robert read the script? Hey, now. (laughs) Have you seen some of the shit he's been in? I mean, come on. He's been in some great stuff, but <laughs> everything hasn't been great. No. You're in the you're in the business long enough, you're going to make some crap. <laughs> Indeed. But would now, have been a much different film, that's for sure. It would have been. With that said, I think I like it better this way because as much as I enjoy Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark, there is only so much of that I can take. And Tony Stark and the occasional Sherlock Holmes are about as much of that as I'm going to be able to take. I think I would have been. I think I'd get sick of it in too much else. 
And so I'm fine with Craig in this movie. And his half-assed American accent actually doesn't bother me either. I say this as someone who speaks with a half-assed Canadian accent because I've only got about half a one. Um, <laughs> And it occurs for the same reason why it would be logical for Daniel Craig to have a half-assed American accent. And that's because I was born in the United States and I moved to Canada for a long time, picked up half an accent. I happen to have come back. But if he was a Brit who had come to America and gone to the Old West, which many of them did, including the mentor to Billy the Kid. So this is not unprecedented at all. Um, that's totally plausible. And okay, you're someplace long enough, you're going to pick up the accent. But when you spent all of your formative years in one place, you're never going to totally lose your old one either. Right. So you end up with a half accent. And I think that's what we got from Daniel Craig, whether that was an acting choice or if his American accent is just that much sh is just that shit. I mean, <laughs> that's possible because like you said, I have never seen him play anything else where he shed his normal voice, including when he was playing characters living in America. So but I didn't find the voice off putting. I thought he played the character well enough. I thought he played it exactly the way the script demanded. Honestly, the one that really jumps out is Harrison Ford, who is a complete dick in this movie. <laughs> Indeed. I mean, now, granted, I've seen the movie where he finally crossed over from always playing good guys to where suddenly he was the villain, and that was the big shocker. <gasps> yeah. Have you seen that movie? Are you talking about, uh, what was that, What Lies Beneath? Yes, that was it. Yeah. Okay. Spoiler alert! Harrison Ford's the bad guy. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Our bad. Our bad. I don't think that was much of a uh, secret more than like a day after the movie came out, because that was like, everybody was talking about it. Yeah, there. And honestly, it didn't come across as much of a shocker as the first time that Alan Alda was a villain. <laughs> oh my God. Hawkeye Pierce, a villain. No. Jesus. But, um... No, Harrison Ford plays a Civil War veteran who has since become a very successful rancher who now pretty much owns the town next to his ranch. And he's a total jerk. And some of the scenes that I think were added in only make him worse. Now, of course, because this is a movie where everybody ends up banding together to fight the alien threat, just like Ronald Reagan would have wanted them to. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, once upon a time, Reagan made a speech to the United Nations where he said, that he thought one way that all the world could be made to come together is if we had to face the threat of an alien invasion. Yes, President Reagan said this in the UN. And I have no problem with that. I think that's a very interesting idea. Whether or not it would work, it depends on how much faith in human nature you have, I suppose. But this script decides that when everybody gets together and fights aliens, even assholes become good people. So, great. Um, as an action adventure movie, it played well. I think it plays even better if... You happen to watch Ancient Aliens. Yes, the Giorgio show. Because, to be completely honest, a lot of what the aliens do in this movie is lifted straight from a lot of the speculation that you will find on programs and in books like Ancient Aliens and things that work along the ancient astronaut theory, including... As one of the very classic ideas, the idea that one reason that aliens would come to Earth is to look for gold. That's a thing. That's actually a very long-standing piece of ancient astronaut theory. And it's funny that you would say that no one would ever picture aliens coming to the Old West because, honestly, if you look at some tribal legends, and this is not even going to Giorgio Tsoukalos' crackpot haven. This is just if you read actual American tribal lore, a lot of these tribal legends believe that they descended from aliens from outer space. That's just how it is. That's their mythology. That's their religion. So it's not unheard of. It's an interesting idea. Olivia Wilde is an interesting idea for all sorts of reasons. <laughs> but I agree with you that the execution could have been better, which is why for the sake of a buck, I only rented this instead of owning it for the second time. <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely one that I would say if it if it pops up on your streaming service of choice, you know, give it a watch. I wouldn't uh, go out of my way to watch it, you know, if you stumble across it in the dollar bin or whatever. Yeah, sure, go for it. Yeah, if it's like I said, if it's on, if it, it's not currently on Netflix, but if it uh, shows up on Netflix or on Amazon Prime or whatever, um, 
you know, hey, give it a look. But don't go into it expecting anything more than an action movie with a little bit of a quirky premise, basically. Um, alien movies have been done better. You know, if you're looking for a movie about aliens, there are better movies to draw from. I mean, there's well, Alien and Aliens. Um, there's Independence Day. You see, I, <laughs> well, I, you see I'm going to totally disagree with you there because I love Alien. I think it's a fantastic movie. Aliens is the last movie out of that entire series that I would choose to watch. And I think Independence Day is hideously overrated. Independence Day was fun. and It uh, was kind of fun, but in the same level of... I would put it at the exact same level I would put Cowboys and Aliens. I'd watch it. I would not own it. Yeah, I I really enjoyed Independence Day, actually. And I'm actually really looking forward to the sequel, although I am a little trepidatious at the fact that the, the preview for the new Independence Day was awesome. Gave me goosebumps. And then I look back and I realized, okay, what gave me goosebumps about this trailer was the recitation of the speech from the first one. <laughs> so I'm like, hmm, maybe this doesn't bode well for their original storyline here. <laughs> but I'm still willing to give it a chance. But no, I really enjoyed the first one. Um, I, I felt it was 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 really well done. And that was like when, when Will Smith was in his prime of churning out a blockbuster every year for July. Um, I, I, I loved it. I'm... I'm about at the same level with it as I am on this movie, which is exactly what you said. If it's if it's there, go for it. Don't go out of your way for it. It's Fair enough. it's there. Now, with that said, if you like alien oriented movies and you want to see something that isn't usually done, just the fact that there are cowboys in this movie <laughs> should be enough to make this worth your distraction. It's not going to be cost you that much. But just for casual action adventure, it's there. And honestly, out of all of the movies that we're talking about, and I do mean all of them, this is the one that I think Craig brings the least to the table for. And I don't mean that he doesn't try, because I think he does exactly what he's hired to do, which is, again, play somebody who is stuck in a world that is outside of normal living, and he wants to get out. Man, he plays these parts all the damn time. (laughs) But... He is the least of a factor for me in this movie out of all of the ones we're going to talk about. Wow. I, I can uh, I can agree with that because um, he's just so much so out of what I would consider his normal element. It doesn't feel like the Daniel Craig that we know. It, it, it really is just more of uh, yeah, just an actor cashing a check. Basically, it's like, OK, they yep, they hired me to do this, so I'm doing it. But I'm only doing what's on the page, nothing more. And what's on the page isn't really all that deep. Yeah. And th- again, this isn't to say he's phoning it in, but this isn't exactly Macbeth or anything <laughs> like that either. So. Well, they, I don't think they gave him anything to, to work with beyond what was on the page either. You know, I don't think that there was, you know, sometimes you can tell that there's more to a character than what's just written down. And the actor is what brings that out. And even though it's the actor doing it, you still know that that's what was intended by the writer. In this case, I think that he portrayed everything the writer intended him to portray. It's just that that wasn't all that much. Agreed. Now, with that said, one of the producers, Brian Grazer, last year actually said he was sorry about Cowboys and Aliens and said that in the production meeting, he thought, Cowboys and Aliens? You're really going to call it that? I think that's out of line. To me, I honestly want to turn around and tell him to F himself. I mean, that's just, I don't think that's cool. I, I respect that people can have their opinions. That's fine. I mean, we're all about opinions, let's face it. But he put his name on this as something he was willing to produce. So if he thought at the very beginning that it was going to be crap, it's not like he needed the paycheck. It's not like he needed the money. He could have said no. So if he didn't believe in it in the position he was in, then I'm calling bullshit. I'm calling someone who looks at how well it did. I don't think he would have made those remarks if it had made $400 million. So I I thought those comments were out of line because I don't think it's that bad. I don't think it's great, but I don't think it's that bad. It's a middle of the road action movie with a cool premise that doesn't hit the high notes it wants to and with lackluster aliens, but they're still there. They're fine. It's not like you're watching, you know, something really cheesy from the 40s that was made with pie tins. So there's that. They're interesting. The aliens, uh, to me, they they came across a little too turtle-like for my taste. 
Like they had that kind of the the way their their heads were like so much smaller than the rest of their bodies. Um, it was the only thing I found interesting about it was the fact that they had like that second set of little hands that came out, um, and the fact that when those came, those were tucked behind their their exoskeleton along with their quite obvious heart. <laughs> so once they brought those little hands out, they were quite vulnerable. Uh, up until that point, they were pretty impenetrable. But uh, once once the little hands came out, oh hey look, your heart's like right there dude i can just poke it with a stick it's a pokey band <laughs> <laughs> but so anything else to say about cowboys and aliens uh no i think that about about covers it um i thought harrison ford did a good job in it as far as uh the part that he was given um you know i think like you said he comes off as a total dick but i believe that's the way the part was written and i believe he plays it well and i believe he does a good job of convincing us that he's this dick but when push comes to shove, he he does the right thing, and you do so, he, he softens uh, appropriately. I think not too much, but enough for the for the part. So I think he did a good job in the part he was given. I think he did as well. And there's also a milestone here. This is the first movie where he was not playing Indiana Jones, where he was convinced to wear a hat <laughs> because. And initially he didn't want to because to him that means Indiana Jones, but they said you're playing a cowboy and, you know, hat. So he did finally agree. But this is the first time since he played Indiana Jones where you will see Harrison Ford wearing a hat. Oh, interesting. So with that said, we do have a bonus movie. Bonus Craig Flick. I wonder what that could be. Which also features Harrison Ford. Ha <laughs> ha. Not wearing a hat. Yeah, no, no hats. No hats. Whereas Daniel Craig is wearing a hat. Indeed. Oh, is it really a hat? Or does, is that considered a hat? Or is a helmet a totally different thing? Well, it's headgear. Okay. So. He's wearing something on his head. <laughs> I think we have enough time that has passed, a um, bit over three months now, that we are no longer in spoiler territory when we can talk about Daniel Craig's now well-known cameo in Star Wars Episode Seven: The Force Awakens. Oh yeah! Um, just in case, if you haven't seen it yet, what, what, what's wrong with you? Um, go watch it right now, and then come back, and we'll discuss Daniel Craig's cameo in it. But um, seriously, I'm pretty sure, judging by the fact that it's made two billion dollars already, that just about anybody who wants to see this film has seen it at least once, uh, if not more than once right now. Uh, I myself have seen it three times in theaters, which, uh, unlike Ziggy, I do not get out to the theater that often. In fact, it's very rare um, I, I get out to actual movie theater usually once every few months if I'm lucky. Everything else is watched at home. So the fact that I managed to see this one in the theaters three times tells you something about the film itself. Um, in fact, the only movies I've seen in the theater, uh, the last movie I saw before Star Wars was Spectre. And the only one I've seen since then is Deadpool. So, and you saw Spectre twice in a theater. I did, indeed. Um, that was another one that you know, obviously had to have multiple viewings. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that tells you the, the space between when I go see, the, <laughs> go see movies. And that was even shocking to go see Spectre twice in the theater and then just a, a month later uh, seeing Star Wars in the theater. Uh, but obviously, it's Star Wars. Come on now. you got to watch in the theater. And uh, this one was well worth the multiple trips uh, for sure. In fact, I'm hoping to maybe get a chance to go see it one more time in the theaters before it actually leaves theaters. I understand it's... Uh, coming out uh, possibly next month um, on uh, on disc and streaming services. So probably won't be in the theaters too much longer, but I know it's still playing in my local theater. So I remember when it took over a year for movies to go from even theater to rental, much mm -hmm. less being available to the general public for home yeah. video. Yeah. And I still remember when, when it was released for rental, you didn't mean you could buy it unless you wanted to pay it. the The VHS tapes cost like $180 or something like that. Because they were only selling them to rental locations. So it was literally rental only. And then a few months later, then they would start selling them for for actual purchase. Um, yeah, it's crazy. Now it's like, okay, well, we've got it. Might as well just put it out there. <laughs> and we already know what the Blu-ray edition of Batman vs. Superman is going to be at like. And that doesn't come out for a month in theaters. <laughs> that, so. is, uh, that is interesting. The fact that, okay, I love Deadpool. I thought it was fantastic. And I'm very, very glad that they chose to go R-rated with it. Because 
that's what the character needed to be done properly. If you've ever read any actual Deadpool comics, if you know Deadpool from anything outside of just the pop culture phenomenon that he's become, you understand that that is an R-rated character. And trying to do a PG-13 version of that movie just would not have worked very well. It would have been uh, it would have been missing something. And it would so, have been X-Men Origins Wolverine, oh, which was not good. It was awful. Um, but no, so they did a good job with it, and I felt that uh, not only did they you know, take full advantage of the R rating, but they, they made it really, really work. This does not mean that every superhero movie from here on out needs to be rated R. And that seems to be where people are leaning. Like, oh, well, uh, Deadpool was successful as R, so uh, Batman vs. Superman, we're going to put out an R rated version on the disc. Really? Now, you yeah. know you're going to just throw in, you're literally going to be adding gratuitous violence for the sole purpose of getting it up to an R rating. Oh, you mean like they did with Man of Steel, even though they didn't quite get an R rating for that? It's exactly. They're just trying to, it's like, how about this? How about you tell the story, you see what rating you get. If you don't like that rating, then you can adjust things to, to go up or down, depending on where you're trying to go. Most of the time you're trying to go down because you're trying to get more people into the theater. And there are people who will say no to R rated movies. So most of the time you start with a movie that is probably on the cusp of an R and then you try to get it knocked down to that PG-13. Now, just yeah. because Deadpool was successful, they're like, oh, well, now we're going to we're gonna just add stuff randomly to make it an R-rated and throw out an R-rated version so people will be like, oh, yeah, it's an R-rated, yeah. I think that's dumb, quite frankly. I, I agree, especially with Superman. And yeah. Who I think, honestly, I hated Man of Steel. I thought it was a destruction of the character. <laughs> I thought it was just terrible. I completely agree, with the exception that I actually liked the film because I've always hated Superman. <laughs> Not hated, I shouldn't say that, but I've never liked Superman as a character. He always was too much of a goody-goody and too powerful for a goody-goody. I was like, okay, so he's like the perfect gentleman. Hey, great. And he's also, he's got laser vision and freeze breath and x-ray vision and he can fly and he's super strong and he's bullet. I'm like, oh, come on now. Did they just give him all the powers? But yet he never does anything with them because he's too much of a goody-goody to do anything with them. So I actually liked Man of Steel, but I agree that that's not who Superman is. <laughs> but that's why no. I liked it. <laughs> If well, we're still on this tangent, and then I promise we'll get back to Daniel Craig. <laughs> One thing I would like to recommend, if you would like to see a different take on Superman, um, graphic novel um, based on a miniseries comic called Superman Red Sun, and that's spelled S-O-N. It is based on the premise of what if, instead of landing in Smallville, Kansas, Superman had landed in the middle of a collective farm in the Soviet Union during the time of Stalin. Oh. Very interesting take on what would have happened and highly recommended to comic book fans and people who either really like Superman or for people who like comic books but don't necessarily like Superman and would like to see something else happen to him. Here you go. <laughs> so I'll with that to, said, I'll, I'll hunt that down and give it a look because that does sound quite interesting. It's, it really was. It, I, I do recommend it. And I also, of course, recommend Star Wars The Force Awakens. And I am proud Bring to say back. that I spotted Daniel Craig the first time I saw the movie. I even told you I spotted Daniel Craig the first time <laughs> I saw the movie. I knew he was in there as a stormtrooper. That had been spoiled already. You know, just the fact that, oh, yeah, Daniel Craig was on the set and, you know, he was able to, to jump in and do a cameo as a stormtrooper. I had assumed. And the reason he, w he was on the set was that Spectre was filming next door. So they were really close. And let's face it, he knew a certain cowboy on the set. So <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah, they invited. I guess they invited him over. Or he was there and was like, "Hey, yeah, I'll be a stormtrooper. Heck yeah, I'll be a stormtrooper." Um, and so he got a cameo. And now I assumed when I'd heard that that he was just a random stormtrooper. Like you know, there's hundreds of them in the film, and many of them, most of them, don't have any lines. They don't talk. They're just there. Um, so I had assumed that his cameo was going to be just like that. He's just going to be one of those things like I get to look at myself on screen and say, hey, that's me. Nobody else is ever going to know it, but that's me. Uh, that is not the case. Um, <laughs> fact, the matter is he got uh, more lines than Luke Skywalker did. So <laughs> very, uh, very fun scene, as a matter of fact, that he is in. And uh, it's especially fun when you know he's James Bond, because as the scene progresses, his Stormtrooper character does the so least Bond thing ever. <laughs> And 
like I said, I think we're beyond spoiler territory. And if you haven't seen the movie yet, what's wrong with you? So for those who are still wondering where Daniel Craig is in this movie, you don't tell which stormtrooper he is by looking for the ears behind the mask, which is what Eric joked to me when I said I found him. <laughs> I thought maybe his ears it, were sticking out like they did with the uh, with the Day of the Dead mask inspector. But nope, that wasn't it. No, nope, it is the fact, as Eric mentioned, that he has lines. And his voice, even though it's modulated through the Stormtrooper helmet, is still distinctive, especially because of his cadence. So in the scene where Ray is being held captive by the First Order on Starkiller Base, and she's strapped to the torture device, she decides to use the Force to convince the Stormtrooper guarding her to let her out. And that Stormtrooper, who is officially uncredited, but who has since been given the names by legions of fans <laughs> of Trooper JB-007. Of course. <clears throat> first calls her scavenger scum and says that he will tighten her restraints. But then thinks about it, says, you know, Daisy Ridley's kind of hot. Really is. And I will remove these restraints and then I will leave the room. And then, and this is my favorite part because of the offhanded way that he delivers a line. He doesn't say this line like a zombie. And I will drop my weapon. <laughs> that was the, that's the best part. She's she's just in there like testing it out. She's like she she has no training in the force yet. So she's not the only training she's had is literally having it attempted to be used on her and sh her discovering that she can fight back. So the only experience she's had with this is literally having it done to her and like realizing okay maybe this is a thing that I can do. And so she tries it and she tells this the stormtrooper who's who's guarding her not even face to face with her he's like standing behind her he's like you will remove my restraints and leave this cell with the door open and he's like i won't and she's like no you will and he's like okay i will <laughs> but yeah that line because when she suddenly because she delivers it the same way she's uh, uh offhand she's like and you will drop your weapon and i will drop my weapon <laughs> and then he just tosses it and <laughs> <just> walks off <laughs> um now i have you read the uh the novelization I have not read it. I have. I, and, I know uh, some of the difference, but please go on. Well, there, there isn't a huge difference here other than the fact that uh, they find Trooper JB-007 later on. They don't they, they don't identify him as that in the book either. I, I would love it if they did, but they did not. Uh, but they do find him later, and he is basically describing it's like, I woke up in my room not knowing what – I don't know how I got here. I was on duty. I was guarding her, and then I was in my room. I don't know what happened. <laughs> so it was kind of interesting to see a little bit of the aftermath of that, which is something we didn't get to see in the film. Um, if you haven't uh, read it yet, I definitely highly recommend it. It does add a few things here or there to the film. Uh, it's definitely it's not the best novelization of a movie I've ever read, but uh, it's definitely worth reading. And it definitely does add some little details to the story that if if they were originally in the film script, they may have gotten cut for time or, or whatever. But it does add a few things here and there that that do uh, definitely fill in the story a bit. Yeah. Um, one thing J.J. Abrams did say in interviews is he did want to pare down a lot of backstory because his view was that pretty much everyone who was really interested in the Star Wars backstory knew everything that had happened in the previous movies and that they just wanted to get on to the new story and yeah. not all the meat in between. Whether that's true or not is, of course, a matter of individual preference, but that's the approach he was going for. And it, it worked for me, definitely, uh, being a, a fan of Star Wars for a long time. I've definitely seen the other movies multiple times, um, so I definitely don't need a ton of backstory into that aspect of it. And I think he did, I think he walked a good line, and I think the, the numbers back him up. I mean, people watched this movie, and they watched it over and over again. Um, a lot of people did that. You know, I know a lot of people who aren't usually repeat movie watchers who went and saw this movie several times. So. Yeah, I I have seen this movie so far three times in a theater. Um, I do recommend the 2D version over the 3D. I do not think the stereoscope actually adds a whole lot to it. I agree. Um, I did see it. One of the times I watched it was in 3D. And um, while some of the space scenes were cool in 3D, it was not enough. And there were scenes when there were actual character-driven scenes, especially. There was one scene in particular when they're on the Millennium Falcon. And you're seeing... The hologram? No, not even the hologram. This is when uh, Ray and Finn are talking to Solo. And Solo's in the foreground, so he's 
in focus and in 3D in front of you. But Ray and Finn are supposed to be in focus as well, but because they've got that 3D effect going on, they're not. They're like blurry in the background. And it's like, no, these this is three people just having a conversation right now. This is not something that 3D is necessary for. And in fact, it's distracting right now from the scene. Like if I hadn't, maybe I wouldn't have noticed if I hadn't already seen it in 2D before watching it in 3D. But there were moments like that when there were multiple characters on the screen and they were actually talking when there was dialogue going on that the 3D was was just distracting more than it was, uh, more than it added anything. So I agree. 2D for this one was definitely the the better experience. And if you have the opportunity, IMAX. I did see it once on an IMAX screen, and it it popped. It was just fantastic. I was. So, I also saw the IMAX, but it was the IMAX 3D. So okay. It was nice but, to be that big. The you know the like four story screen. We, we managed to get seats right in the middle, and it was really good seats, really good view. But the 3D aspect was a little distracting for me. So. I don't know if they, uh, I don't know if they do the IMAX uh, 2D here, or if they only they only do the 3D here. But I'll have to check that out. But I, I'll be interested to see when it does come out on Blu-ray if it's optimized for 4K or not. I mean, granted, every um, TV that has 4K capability will do automatic upscaling. I, I, I remember going through a store. Um, just before Force Awakens came out, and the way they were demonstrating their 4K TVs was playing the trailer for Force Awakens. <laughs> and holy crap, did that look good. So I have no worries that it's going to look good whether they optimize for it or not, but it'll be interesting to see if they do. And if they do, if they then take all of the other movies that they've been selling for a slightly lower price but still a kind of a premium and optimize those for 4K to make you buy them again. There you go. <laughs> Yeah, definitely, definitely very possible. But for any James Bond fan out there, the um, cameo of Daniel Craig as the unofficial trooper JB007 is a real treat, and I thought it was great. I'm really glad that he was able to do that. I'm really glad he wanted to do that. I just thought it was really cool. So for all you Bond fans out there, definitely worth checking out. Yeah. I mean, it was one of those things I was definitely going to be watching that movie anyway, but it was very interesting. The first time I saw it, I knew he was in there somewhere, but I didn't know where, and I didn't catch the voice right away. Like afterwards thinking about it, I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I uh, totally am. When I watched it the second time, having known at that point, then for sure I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, just absolutely very fun scene to begin with. And then the, you know, the added knowledge that, Hey, that's James Bond in there. That's always fun as well. So that is our quick take on episode seven, the force awakens. Um, any other comments you want to make about any of the films we've talked about from Craigslist? Uh, no, I think we, we've covered it. Um, like I said, definitely highly recommend layer cake. Not so much on, uh, renaissance or cowboys and aliens but uh and definitely highly recommend star wars go watch it again whereas for me i highly recommend layer cake uh, i also recommend renaissance to a specific type of audience um i give a mediocre grade to cowboys and aliens and star wars man i mean star wars the only franchise where i can say i've seen the movies more often than james bond movies star wars and you're trying to th- you may you may be trying to do the math in your head and thinking, but there's only been seven movies. Well, I stopped counting how many times I watched the original Star Wars at 300, <laughs> and that was a long time ago. <laughs> so galaxy far, far away. Um, feels like it sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I I have also watched the original trilogy um, many many times. I I never bothered trying to count in the first place. I don't know if I'm quite up into the hundreds or not, but definitely. That was something I watched as a kid, and then growing up, rewatched them. I've, it's, those are movies that I go back to um, at least once a year, if not more than that. Um, they're on constant rotation. I mean, they're right up there with The Princess Bride for me as movies that I can always watch on a moment's notice and never be disappointed. Um, now, the prequels, uh, I've seen them all multiple times. Not nearly as many times as the, the original trilogy. Um, Agreed. <laughs> but... 
I have watched them multiple times as well. And every now and then when I'm feeling especially a completist, I'll, I'll go back through and I'll watch all of them, all six of them. Um, and so, yeah, uh, as a Star Wars fan, as a, as a definite fan of the franchise, I mean, I've read tons of the novelizations. I've played, I've not only played, but I've actually run uh, Star Wars role-playing games in the past. Um, definite fan of the franchise. And Episode Seven did not disappoint in the slightest. It was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I was very, very happy with it as well. And come the time for Phoenix Comic Con, uh, I think Eric may have a special treat for some people. And I will have one that crosses just one area of our fandom as opposed to both, but that's okay. <laughs> but that's for in the future. Um, also in the future, you can expect a very killer episode to come after this one for Her Majesty's Secret Podcast. Um, if you uh, have seen any of the films from Craig's List and you agree or disagree with us and want to talk about it some more, we are really easy to reach out there on the interwebs. You can go to our website, hermajestyspod.com, find this episode, leave a comment in the comment section. You can also go to facebook.com slash hermajestyspod, leave a comment there you can also email us directly you can email me at ziggy at cinema on the you can also visit my website cinema on the rocks for some movie reviews including of some of the movies that we've talked about today um, you can also tweet me at cinema otr you can uh, tweet at me at Eric J. Dewey. Uh, you can email me, Eric, at HerMajesty'sPod.com or Eric at FourEyedRadio.com, whatever's easier for you. Um, and, yeah, definitely let us know if you've seen any of these films, if you uh, agree, disagree, or indifferent, um, if there's something else, if there's an aspect of the films that you think that we missed or misinterpreted and you want to set us straight, absolutely let us know. We definitely love hearing from our fans. Um, we put out an episode about the, the, the cars of the James Bond universe a couple weeks back, and we had fantastic uh, response from our audience. Um, one of you actually gave us a whole bunch of pictures of the cars from the uh, the James Bond Museum in London, which was absolutely fantastic, someplace that I really hope to visit sometime in the future. Um, so that was that was an awesome treat for us to, to get those pictures and be able to throw them up on our Facebook page as well. So thank you for that. Yes, thank you very much, Tyle. And thank you to everyone for listening to this episode and to all of them. We will have another one for you in a couple of weeks. But in the meantime, I'm Ziggy Berkeley. And I'm Eric Dewey. And you have been listening to Her Majesty's Secret Podcast, only on The Fern.